It's been offered as a cure for what ails Canadian elections, but the Fair Elections Act has become a hotly contested bill that puts issues such as vouching, robocalls, and campaign finance at the center of an intense public debate. Joining us now for their take on the bill, Aaron O'Toole. He's Conservative MP for the riding of Durham. Yasmin Dawood, law professor at the University of Toronto. And Andrew Coyne, columnist with Post Media, and we are happy to welcome you back. You back, and you here for the first time, I think. Thank you. Pleasure to have you here. Okay, I, I want to start in the same place for this discussion as I did with the minister, which is namely, when you bring a bill in, it's usually designed to solve a problem. Does this bill, Andrew, you first, solve the problems that the government purports to put forward? It's not entirely clear what they think the problems are. There was a perception after the 2011 election that we had a problem with irregularities, uh, the Etobicoke Senator riding, for example, and we also had these things in the air about robocalls. Um, when you look at what actually is in the bill, there's so much that's not addressed to any of that that wasn't called for by anybody who looked into that, i.e. Harry Newfeld, the pro fellow who wrote the, um, the report on the 2000 election problems. Uh, and instead, you, you get into things like uh, you know, raising the limits on, on campaign contributions, which nobody was really calling for, or trimming the wings of Elections Canada to investigate irregularities when Elections Canada was asking for more powers to do that. And you just sort of come out saying, well, then the problems apparently were there's not enough money in politics and Elections Canada is too powerful an investigator, which I think would, people would have a lot of time problem identifying as real problems in our system. So would the colloquial conclusion be they've kind of got this ass backwards? Well, yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, they didn't really consult anybody to begin with. To the extent that people were making recommendations, they seemed to have either ignored them or gone in the opposite direction. Uh, they've had all kinds of criticism since then from informed people that they seem to be just waving off. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to know who was calling for any of the proposals that they put into this. It seems to have just been basically cooked up in the Prime Minister's office. Professor Dawood, as you look at this, what problems that are out there related to elections, does this bill uh, help to solve? I actually don't think it solves any problems that are currently uh, a problem in elections. So for example, uh, the commissioner had asked for the power to compel witness testimony a number of times. Elections Canada has repeatedly asked for the, uh, to require political parties to provide um, election uh, receipts for all their expenses. Uh, neither of those two powers have been granted to Elections Canada or to the Commissioner. This makes it almost impossible uh, for the Commissioner to do his job in terms of rooting out electoral fraud. So it's really a puzzle as to what, um, what the bill is hoping to achieve in terms of making elections more fair. Without having Elections Canada as an independent agency that and additionally has the power to um, hire uh, specialized staff. Now the, the bill says that they have to get Treasury Board approval. So in all kinds of ways, uh, we're seeing Elections Canada hampered. There's a gag order on, election, on the Chief Electoral Officer and the Commissioner. Again, why a gag order? I mean, isn't it important for Elections Canada to be able to speak to Canadians about uh, the right to vote and also about any problems that come up in the electoral process? So I would agree that the, uh, you know, that the, the bill does not address any real problems and in fact make, makes it much more difficult to have fair elections. Okay, Aaron, uh, the two interviews we've done already, these two comments we've heard here, whatever the merits of the bill, uh, for the last six months, your government has tried to sell the merits of it, so far seemingly without success. The polls are 50-50 on it, basically, and a lot, I guess a lot of people are still wondering, the problems you are trying to solve don't seem to be solved by this bill. What's your reaction? Well, Steve, I think, you know, we've heard uh, some of my colleagues tonight suggested came from certain places, the Prime Minister's office, that sort of thing. We live in a great parliamentary democracy that runs very well, so you have to really have followed these issues very closely to see where this came from. And it did indeed come from the 2011 election, a uh, case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada uh, that identified irregularities that Andrew talked about, but also problems with the administration of our elections. That case, the Etobicoke Centre case, went to the Supreme Court of Canada. We should just remind everybody, that was a really hard fought, very close. 26 I mean, vote 26 margin. 26 vote margin There of were victory. issues raised with registration. Uh, there was issues raised with vouching. There was issues raised with the training of these people that sometimes work for a couple of days a year. And the Conservative won by 26 votes, and ultimately the Supreme Court upheld that That's right. Verdict. The lower court in Ontario reversed the election, which is quite unusual, and it shows that these votes count. Every vote counts. Most, elec most elections will have anywhere between 5 and 15 ridings uh, decided by 500 votes. And Mr. Neufeld said there's 500 votes error in each riding. So there was a Supreme Court case 
Elections Canada took that and asked Mr. Neufeld to do a report. He did an audit that, that audited 1,000 polls, as well as 50 polls for my by-election, which is when I started following this closely. I knew Ted Opitz from Etobicoke Centre. Uh, I followed the, the audit process. And Mr. Neufeld's report, uh, if you read pages 23 to 27, said our system's antiquated, needs reform. Now, you may disagree with some of the elements of reform, like taking on vouching, like some other improvements, but this did not come out of thin air. This came out of the need to reform our electoral system. Right. And that doesn't even address the robocalls issues, which did dominate media over the last few right. years. There and, were issues all parties have had with automated calls. This and so does that's deal with robocalls well. and yeah. lots, everybody hates so robocalls. That's where it comes from. So, no, we get that. There doesn't seem to be too much disagreement on the fact that getting robocalls, misleading robocalls out of politics would be a good thing. Uh, having said that, we have heard significant and numerous testimony that vouching will disenfranchise people. Do you not see that? Absolutely not, Stephen. It's important to look at why. You know, vouching, there was 120,000 vouchers in the last election, according to the audit, which is statistically significant. There were 95,000 errors. So some cases had more than one error, but Mr. Neufeld said there was 46% of those 120,000 had serious enough errors to call into question the votes. So he also said, I think at page 27 of his report, that it will be a very difficult uh, task for the government to fix the concept of vouching with the way our elections run, with very, you know, people that work for one day, with the fact that, you know, you have to check certain measures. People can only vouch for someone else once. It was a very complicated process. Only people that have no forms of ID whatsoever would be disenfranchised. The audit did not say these 120,000 people uh, had no identification, nor did his audit say they were primarily students or other disenfranchised groups. All right, let me get the politics of this with Andrew Coyne. Uh, we've heard the allegation from Craig Scott that the vouching has become a big deal because the Conservatives are using that as a kind of a you know, wedge issue to say, see, I mean, you've got to have one piece of ID, surely, one out of 39. Uh, never mind all this other stuff we're doing, just focus on the vouching. To that extent, if that's true, it's kind of worked, hasn't it? It's worked to the extent that, it, that people have focused on that, and it, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, if you're not particularly familiar with the details of the debate, and I'll give you an example of that, me, early on in this debate, you can find a video clip online of me saying, I don't have really a problem with, with banning vouching, that seems like a sensible thing, because I didn't really fully inform at that point. When you delve into it and you say, okay, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Is voter fraud actually a problem? No, it is not. Uh, is it easy for people to get the requisite ID? In some cases, no, it is not. Should we take seriously the fact that people might actually be disenfranchised as a result of this? I mean, people say, well, you have to, you know, I, we heard the minister say, you have to have ID to buy a beer. Yeah, buying a beer is a little bit different than voting. And voting is one of those moments when people who are on the absolute far margins of society, people who don't have a lot of education, uh, who don't have a, a, a TV show to go on, uh, where they actually get listened to. People who are absolutely penniless or what have you, they all get a say. We should take that deadly seriously. And if there's no problem of, of voter fraud, on the other hand, a real di danger that people are going to be disenfranchised as a result of this, we should take that very seriously. So yeah, I think it's, can, it's can unfortunate that it's become a, it's a, it's a, it's a good hot button issue for them because they say, well, you know, why shouldn't you have ID? Let me put it clearly, I'm in favor of requiring ID as of the 2007 law that was brought in by the Conservative Party. You are required to have ID, except we have a fail safe for people for whom that would be a problem. Why that was sensible policy in 2007 and is no longer sensible policy in 2014 has not been well explained. Aaron will right now. Uh, I, I wanted to jump in there because Andrew is, is addressing two different issues. And in this debate, there's been talk of two different issues that are both important. You know, there's, there's uh, vulnerable populations that have very low voter participation. And then there's this ID requirement, you know, and the elimination of vouching at registration. Those are not related. So Elections Canada's report on the disabled, on Aboriginal and, and youth voters and low participation rates says clearly it's not related to ID and registration issues. And experts that have appeared before our procedure committee have said those two issues are different. So people not participating in our system, those are deeper issues that we should strive to solve. And in fact, some of the 39 forms of identification, Elections Canada, they came up with those forms, came out of their 2007 report, the attestation letters for, for a shelter, for instance, because that vouching doesn't work for a shelter. The administrator of a, of a shelter can only vouch for one person 
under the, under the rules so now. So that's not going to work. So the standard form letter that Elections Canada has performed, and we've heard from homelessness advocates on this, it's a single page letter. So used properly, you, the rules now, the 39 forms, if, if there was as much passion dedicated to the participation issue, uh, Aboriginal reserves could produce that letter for every single resident the day the election starts. Same with homelessness uh, issues, same with okay. student issues. Let so those are the rules now. Let me follow up on the letter angle because you were, I think you're one of the several hundred university I professors yes, across the country right. yes. who signed a letter mm -hmm. saying this thing's not working. What's your main beef with why you figured that we need to have that letter out there? The letter of the academics? Yeah. Well, I think that we felt that we had to weigh in with our expertise in terms of elections and electoral law uh, because we felt that uh, it was important given the fact that there was almost no consultation while this bill was being drafted. And since then, we really felt that the government had not been paying attention or was dismissing a lot of the criticisms that had been raised about the bill. We thought it was really important to uh, join the public debate and you know, offer our thoughts on this bill. And Has we're it had an impact? The letter? Well, we feel that it has. We feel that people do refer to our letter. People, we've, we certainly received a lot of uh, commentary from others. I think um, we, we're in a position where we can articulate why we think from uh, first principles, international standards on electoral integrity, why this bill falls short in a number of ways on, on those aspects. So, yes, I, I think that it has made a difference. Do you think you can get the government to change one clause in the bill as a result of the pressure you're putting on them? Again, I can't speak for the government, right? I, I think as it stands, the bill has so many problems with it that we are all bewildered and perplexed as to why the government would come up with a bill that has uh, such uh, glaring flaws uh, in terms of elections. So, Andrew? Well, and the flaws are as much to do with the process as the content. We can all talk about the various different things, and they go well beyond vouching. And, you know, whatever the context was in the 2011 election, it's very hard to see, hard to see why that required uh, exempting, uh, you know, spending for raising party funds from, from contribution limits. It's very hard to see why that required inserting uh, partisans into poll stations as supervisors. All these things may or may not have something to defend them, but they've got nothing to do with the originating controversy. But as I say, the failure to consult anybody, either to try to gather uh, uh, all party consensus on this or to consult experts on this, the failure to explain it in any kind of sensible way, the, the, the motivations for so many of these things remains a mystery. The s dismissive sneers that the minister in particular has, smears I should say, against good people, expert people who've come out uh, against this and criticized this as being either self-interested or, or celebrities or these kinds of, of, of sneering asides. All of that you put together means when we go into the next election, we're going to be going under a shadow of this bill and all of the controversy surrounding it. And you're going to have the opposition on the one hand saying uh, that this bill was designed to fix the election. And whether that's overstated or not, it's a terrible state of affairs if that's the kind of suspicion that's been allowed to take hold. And on the other hand, you've got Tories defending the bill saying, well, Elections Canada is, is they're biased against us, that they're hopelessly prejudiced against us, and you'll get some of them saying openly that the bill was brought in basically as blowback to, to Elections Canada. That's what that's I want to follow That's a terrible state of affairs I, again. That's exactly where I wanted to go next, which is this, this sentiment is out there clearly in conservative circles that Elections Canada, quote unquote, has had it in for your party uh, for the last many years. And this is, in some respects, the conservative party slash government's way of getting even by defanging Elections Canada, taking a lot of their powers and responsibilities away. Could you speak to that? Well, listen, I'm a junior MP, and I, I have never said, I wasn't in the 2011 general election. Um, I was a by-election in 2012, and I've never framed it entirely on fraud or, or this or that. I've tried to frame it based on the Neuf Neufeld report itself, Steve, which I think is so complex, but also addresses a lot of the issues even being raised by my friends but here tonight. But your minister tonight. took a shot at Neufeld. Your minister well, you know, quoted look, Newfeld there, incorrectly there in a parliamentary been, there debate. There has been, I think, a little too much heat and rhetoric on this, on all, on all sides. And I've sat in on the committee hearings and uh, some of the claims that we're, we're doing this for partisan reasons or to, to disenfranchise people that would not normally vote for us aren't based on anything in the bill, but it's based on the partisan atmosphere. Um, and Mr. Newfeld himself said that because our country runs well and our, our democracy is robust, reforming what he called as an antiquated system will lead to a lot of pushback, including but, from election but, administrators. But Sheila Fraser, who's a person of some repute in this she country, is. said this is an affront to democracy. Don't you have to listen when she says something like, when, when it's somebody like her who says that? I think we've heard from a lot of voices at, uh, at the committee, including hers, Steve, but 
I find I do find it interesting, and I'll have to say this, that Elections Canada just last year appointed a, a panel of eminent people to to consult with regularly, and Mr. Manning was one, and Ms. Fraser, uh, eminent, respected people, and and they didn't need that advisory committee years ago, but um, they knew there was going to be substantial reform coming, and I think it shows a sort of reluctance to update uh, our approach to admi administering elections. It, I would rather it stay on the merits of each principle, because even, uh, as Andrew said, having partisan appointments, um, DROs have been appointed for decades. DROs? Uh, Deputy Return returning, officers returning officers have been appointed on recommendation of the parties for, for years. In fact, the Neufeld report showed that the current system that allows the parties to recommend certain poll clerks only leads to 29% of the hundreds of thousands of people they need. Yes, me? Okay, so the way it works now is you have a, a one party recommends the DRO and one party recommends the poll clerk. And the idea is that they're supposed to watch each other. What this bill does, which is different, is that the central poll supervisor is now going to be a partisan appointment. The reason that's a problem is because the central poll supervisor is the person who resolves disputes, who is the final call on whether a voter is eligible. We don't want that person to be a partisan appointment. Uh, so even though it makes sense uh, on, on some theories to have these two partisan appointments watch each other and make sure that there's no uh, breaking of the rules, you can't have the person who's in charge of the entire polling stations or several polling stations to be a partisan appointment. The tiebreaker's got to be neutral. Precisely. And you yeah. not see that? The, the challenge, Mr. Neufeld found, that even in the existing system Professor Daywood outlined, the, the parties only provided 29% of the 230,000 volunteers needed for an election. Uh, the, part of the challenge is, is finding and training people for one or two days work each year and that has led to some of the errors. So I think any way they can be found or appointed, those people will still be bound by uh, the rules governing election officers and can be removed. It's, they're not partisan appointments so they'd be similar in some ways to any agency board of commission that if, if you're in that role, you cannot be partisan. But again, nobody recommended this. Nobody said the problem with our system is we don't have enough partisans at the polling station. In fact, people were recommending the opposite. Everyone who's looked at it, not only Elections Canada, but independent elections experts have all said this is a bad idea. Nobody's saying you're going to rig the elections doing this, but it just goes in the wrong direction. Wouldn't it have been better? You talk about the heat and light, Aaron, but wouldn't it have been better if you'd reached out to the opposition parties and tried to gather some consensus? I'm not saying that's always been done in the past. There's been examples to the contrary. But wouldn't it have been better if you'd gone that way so that you wouldn't have what you're talking about, the heat and more heat than light, the partisan atmosphere? This, of all bills, you would think people would be trying to say, let's make sure that we're all agreed on the rules of the game so that nobody's going to be crying foul and claiming that the system's just, stacked against just them. Just before he answers that, they've got a majority government. They don't really have to do that. They've got the votes. Absolutely. Oh. But, but it's, it's, first of all, in, on any bill, it used to be the case you put out white papers, you sought some kind of input, you tried to gather as large a consensus as you will. Just because you have a majority doesn't mean you always just ram everything down people's throats. But absolutely, if you have a majority and there's important things you have to get done, you have the right to, to do it. This is a particular different type of bill. This isn't about a piece of policy on which people can differ. This is about the rules of the game on which we hope everyone's going to be agreed. Yes, ma'am? It's also the case that in Canada, um, historically, we've always had a multipartisan process. Right, so every, every time electoral reform has been done, Elections Canada has been involved in the drafting, opposition parties have been involved in uh, recommending and agreeing to or disagreeing with various provisions. Uh, well, we they have judges we oversee have, the uh, changing of writing boundaries. The writings, so we've got independent boundary commissions yep. which have hold open hearings where the public can come and give their feedback. So our tradition in Canada has always involved widespread consultation and for good reason. Have you missed, has your government missed the boat on this? It sounds like there is some legitimate criticism here about a failure to consult, a failure to reach out. Why didn't they? Well, the, the proposals in the Fair Elections Act come, as I said, from a variety of, of areas where problems were identified. The Supreme Court decision, the Newfeld report, other reports on, uh, from Elections Canada. So those have gone in to the bill. Where are we now? We're at the committee stage where we're actually sitting almost around the clock because I was sitting on it and, and Professor Daywood came at night and we're hearing a lot of voices and there's some criticisms, there's some similar criticisms on certain points and we're now at the stage where the Senate, the pre-study has, has made some recommendations. Uh, I, you know, I know MPs within caucus are talking about, oh there's cer certain areas where we might be able to 
to look at some of the, the discussion on so this. So you're open to keep, changes? Keep, the minister's open always said that. I know he said, said it, that. but yeah. will he do it? So keeping with the fairness and the principles we want to establish, if there's better ways we can do it. Mr. Neufeld talked about a few ways uh, with respect to, to vouching that weren't really covered in his, his report at committee. So committees often get forgotten as not, not being as effective as they could be, but we've heard from some really good witnesses, and I think there might be an opportunity to make improvements that will strengthen the bill. Let me, let me uh, for de uh, devil's advocate's sake, uh, make his argument a little bit. Parliament is toxic. The relationship among the parties is awful. Even if they'd been incredibly magnanimous and reached out to the opposition parties, who's to say they wouldn't have taken advantage of the opportunity to still bang them like a drum on this thing? Is that possible? I guess it's always possible, but the question is, um, what is the best way to start? Right? So what is the best way to go about this process? And Canada is renowned around the world for our electoral process and the way Canada, Elections Canada works. So why not work, go with what has always worked historically, right? which is to uh, invite during the drafting, I'm not talking about now um, where you've already got a bill, but in terms of the actual drafting of the, uh, of the provisions to have widespread consultation. There's no harm in doing it that way. It's true that the, uh, the drafting process might end up having conflict over certain provisions, but there's no reason to actually not go that route just because you might run into disagreement along the way. Let me put one more thing on the table here in our remaining time, and that is uh, turnout at elections is awful. It's nowhere near what we wish, what everybody in the country wishes it were. Well, I guess I shouldn't say everybody, because lots of people don't seem to mind that um, <laughs> they're not showing up to vote. I don't know who we're going to blame for that. But anyway, the one organization in the country which seemed to have the responsibility to get people to vote has had that power taken away from it, Elections Canada. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make sense. Now, I don't want to overload that. There's a lot of different reasons why turnout is down right. and a lot of blame to be cast around. And I also agree it's partly the responsibility of the parties to try and encourage people to vote. But if it's only left to the party, then you're only going to get the people that the parties think to, to go after. You're going to get a selection of the electorate. And it is, in my opinion, the universe of voters that should be deciding election is everybody, as many as we can possibly get out to the polls, not just whoever the parties decide to select themselves to bring out to the polls. Would you agree that it sort of lends credence to the narrative that you guys have had it in for Elections Canada by taking away this responsibility that they have always had? Well, two things, Steve. I think it's clear in the bill we also want Elections Canada to get back to first principles. So it's clear part of the reason people aren't showing up is they don't understand the flexibility that there is. And in fact, the Fair Elections Act provides a full extra day of advanced poll voting. So there's actually more opportunity to vote. So we want to get back to that basics so that people know when they can vote early, mail in all the sort of special ways to, for people to vote, particularly because we're going to be strengthening the ID requirements. I think there's also been a bit of an overreading of uh, you know, some of the, some of the uh, public education aspects of the bill and we may need to clarify that because I, I don't think anybody wants to see you know, student vote and some of these good programs that get young people engaged I got, not taking place. I've got 20 seconds left here. Do you think there's any chance the opposition are going to be able to find 12 votes on your back benches to vote against this thing? Well, they're already moving to that, and the amendments haven't even come to committee. In fact, committee's not even finished meeting yet. I, I think we're going to possibly see some amendments to, to the bill that will be within the spirit of what it's trying to accomplish. Um, Mr. Neufeld himself did say that the government should move quickly in time for the next election. That's our intention. And then they'll have to decide. I think... Have you got the votes? We've got the votes, Steve. And, and even Mr. Rajat, who brought a letter from his constituents, because we, we're all very passionate constituent politicians, he said he agrees with the spirit of the bill, but some of his people have these concerns. Okay. That's part of the committee process. We're hearing these voices. That's Conservative MP Aaron O'Toole. We thank you for coming in tonight, as do we thank Andrew, oh, excuse me, Yasmin Dawood, the Associate Professor, Faculty of Law for the U of T, and our good pal Andrew Coyne from the National Post and Post Media. Lovely to see you all in here tonight. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.